I'm so excited to be with you this morning. Thank you so much. I want to honor my pastor, Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryan. Y'all, he don't let us leave on Sunday morning. So for me to be able to be with you this morning, I have told him how much I love your pastors and how much I love being with you, how the hospitality is just second to none. They get tired of me at New Birth saying, what a rock church doing like this. <laughs> you know, and so I'm so grateful to be with you. As I was praying, I kept going back and forth about my title and what I wanted to talk to you about this morning. And so I finally got to a pace that I think might be, uh-oh. Sorry, come back. That's all right, Satan. We good. Okay. And I finally got to a place, but I want to give us our text. I'm going to read it as quickly as I can. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go to 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7. And this morning, I actually want to use the Message Bible. I feel like the Message Bible just cut right to it. It just gives you exactly what it is. When you have it, say, I've got it, Pastor Carrie. 2 Kings 4. And we're going to do a little reading this morning. I want to read verses 1 through 7. And the word of the Lord reads, One day the wife of a man from the guild of prophets called out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. You well know what a good man he was. He was devoted to God. And now the man to whom he was in debt is on his way to collect by taking my children as slaves. She had two sons. And Elijah said to her, I wonder how I can be of help. Tell me what you have in your house. Nothing, she said. Then she said, well, I do have a little oil. Somebody say a little oil. Here's what I want you to do, said Elijah. Go up and down the street, hear this, and borrow jugs and bowls from all of your neighbors. Not just a few, but I want you to borrow all that you can. Then come home and lock the door behind you, you and your sons. He says, then pour oil into each container. When each is full, he said, set it aside. She did what he said. She locked the door behind her and her sons, and they brought the containers to her, to her and filled them. She filled them. Then all of the jugs and bowls were full. She said to one of her sons, another jug, please. He said, that's it, mama, ain't no more. Ain't no more jugs. The text then says, then the oil stopped. She went and told the story to the man of God. He said, go sell the oil and make good on your debts. Listen. Then he said, live both you and your sons on what is left. <laughs> ah, listen, we don't even need nothing else. That right there works for me. He says, live both you and your sons on what is left. Father, we thank you. We don't even have to ask you to come, Father, because we know by virtue of your word that you are already here. You said where two or three are gathered, that you would be in the midst. And so, God, we fix our eyes, our heart, and our ears on you. God, we pray that you would speak to us this morning, Father, that our minds would be transformed, our hearts would change and our faith would grow deeper in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. As you're taking your seat, listen, the, the title that I finally came up with, that I, I called my pastor and I said, I can't figure out what it should be called. He said, well, Jesus ain't have no title for the, the Sermon on the Mount. That's what we came up with. <laughs> but today, for the sake of a title, I want to name this, I didn't sign up for this. Look at somebody next to you and say, I didn't sign up. Ooh, child, I didn't sign up for this. We're family. This is my second time coming to you all. I think the last time I was here was like 2018 or 2019. And so much has happened since then. But one of the things that I want you to know about me is that the one thing that can keep me up late at night is money. 
I don't, I don't hear, I don't hear no, it could just be me. It's a lot of stuff that worries me. It used to be men. Ah! They can't cause me to lose no sleep in this season of my life. But money, on the other hand, when I ain't got none, I'm up at 1 and 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning trying to make sense of where I am. And further, the thing that causes me to lose sleep is money. It keeps me up. But I want y'all to know that I could be, listen, don't judge me. I could be, it might not be right, but I want you to know I'm a little prideful because I don't like to ask nobody for nothing. I don't want to borrow nothing. My lights can be off in my house. I may not have no money, no water, but the only person going to know is me. Now, I'm not saying it's right. I'm, not say I'm giving y'all my truth. Can I confess this morning? I don't like to borrow from people, and I really don't even like to talk about money publicly at all. Can I share that with you? Don't worry. It's the person who just grabbed their person, I promise I ain't going to ask you for no offering. I'm telling you what my testimony is. And I realized that that is the case because as a child, I grew up, we was, we was poor, poor. <laughs> Like, we didn't have anything. And it seemed like the reoccurring theme in my household was that there is never enough. You never have enough. Every time I asked my mom for something, can we have this? It was always, baby, mama don't have it right now. Or we can't afford that. Far before we got the, 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 the colloquialism, the math ain't mathing, that was my realization. The math was never mathing because we never seemed to have enough. I realized how poor we were when I was about three or four. I'm an 80s baby, so we grew up a lot different than the rest of, <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about. We grew up a lot different than a lot of the other generations, and I remember even at a young age, I can't imagine sending my three-year-old, I don't have children, but if I did, sending my three-year-old or four-year-old next door, right? Can we borrow some sugar? Can we borrow some eggs? Oh, y'all bougie in here. Let me tell you what I had to do. Can, can we borrow some salt? Do you have some pepper? Can we borrow some Kool-Aid? My mama said, you got $5 we can borrow. You got $20 we can borrow. That is what I had to do. And so I realized very young that there was a precedent being set in my life of never enough. Never enough. And what that did, it began to develop a complex and insecurity in me. It laid a foundation for childhood trauma that really went into adulthood. And it wasn't until I became adult that I even really understood the language of what I was experiencing. And what I was experiencing is what they call money shame. Money shame. Money shame is a painful feeling. It's a humiliation or it's moving in distress. It is a perception of ourselves, hear this, that causes us to feel like we can never come back from poverty. You can never come back from a bad financial mistake. You can never come back from bankruptcy. You can never come back from all of the things that you would think would negatively at, in, uh, impact you as it relates to money. And what happens is when you have money shame, it keeps us from engaging in money in healthy ways. Y'all following me this morning? I promise if you stay with me, we're going to go somewhere. I hate listening to uh, people who give you advice on credit and financial things. Oftentimes, because when they give you advice, they speak to you as if they never had a low credit score. They, they speak to you as if they've never had an account that has been in the negative. It could, just, it could just be me. They speak to you as if they woke up and arrived at a place and sometimes sit from this high space of judgment. And I can't hear from people who are judging me. I got to hear from people who say, Pastor Kerry, I used to be broke. But let me tell you what the spirit of the living God did. My credit score used to be a 300. But let me tell you what God did. And so I lived in a lifestyle really of shame from an early age. Agreeing, hear this, with a lifestyle of lack 
that I didn't even sign up for. There are a lot of things that I got a chance to decide, that we got a chance to decide. We could decide what school we wanted to go to. We can decide what job we want to work, but we don't get to decide who our family going to be. Y'all so quiet. We don't get to decide what, what, what family we would be born into, what economic type of situation we would be born into. And so some of us are living in the side effects of being birthed to a family that we would not probably have chose. And so what I realized is while I didn't choose it and it wasn't my fault, I, it still became my pathology it still became how I live my life. And so this discomfort that I began to feel around money, that I began to feel around lack, that I began to feel around all of these things that made me feel like I was always less than because of how I grew up, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. And he said, if you dislike engaging money, you dislike engaging abundance. He said, and if you dislike engaging abundance, then you dislike engaging God. For God is the highest form of abundance. His character, his personality, hear this, is abundance personified. So when we are uncomfortable with money, because it's tight in the room right now, I promise y'all ain't asking y'all for no seat. Ooh, I feel it. It's tied up in here. What she about to ask us for? I ain't got no 200, 300. No, I promise you I'm not. But that's a problem even in and of itself. But when we are uncomfortable with money, we are uncomfortable with God. And ultimately, we are uncomfortable with abundance coming into our life. Because the truth is, for some of us, our knowledge of him or the, our, the lack thereof is based upon our own confidence or insecurities. Some of you are confident in him as a healer, but you are insecure in him as a provider. You are confident in him as a mind regulator, but you are insecure in him as a miracle worker. And the truth is we know of him, but we do not truly know him. I don't care how often you come to church. Can I tell you, there are people who shout, come to the altar, phone at the mouth, fall out, speak in tongues, and still get up and do not know God. Just because you can perform does not mean that you know him. To truly know him, or if you only accepted one dimension or aspect of who he is, that doesn't mean that you even know him. And the Lord began saying to, you, to me, I'm not your daddy and I'm not your mother. He said to me, the way that you saw them operate in life is not based upon who I am. It is not a reflection of me. Hear this. He said, but it is a reflection of what they believe concerning me. Do not relegate your experience of how you grew up to the vastness of who I am. Because the truth is, you can think about every experience in your life, and it still does not speak to who God is in his totality. You could have grown up in a great environment. Can I tell you, you still scratching the surface on who God is. You could have grown up in a negative environment. Can I tell you, that still doesn't speak to the vastness of who the God of the universe is, the maker and the creator of all things. Your limited experiences doesn't even speak to who he is. He told me that in order to truly know him, that would mean that we would have to walk with him. And to walk with him is to come into the full knowledge of who he truly is. Do you know how God moves? Do you know what he responds to? Do you know how he operates, what the character of him is, what he loves and what we hate? We study everybody else's love language except for God's. 
if I ran it down right now, you can tell me exactly what bingo love language is, who you ain't even still with. But when I ask you, what is the love language of the God of the universe? You wouldn't even be able to tell me. Do you know how he moves? And the truth is, it is by revelation that he discloses his innermost parts to us. This is why Jesus declares in Matthew 16 and 17, hear this, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee. He said, but my father who is in heaven, can I tell you there are some things that you have to understand about God that won't come from a self-help book, won't come from a YouTube video, won't come from a TikTok expert, but it has to come directly from the spirit of God. And God reveals himself to us at the level, hear this, by which we have the capacity to receive him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 and 2, I had fed you with milk and not solid food. He says, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And the truth is, this is what he says, you still aren't ready. What does that mean? Those who are on milk will get the God of milk. Those who are eating meat will get the God of milk, of meat. Can I tell you whether you are on milk or meat, it will be displayed in how far you will go to see the hand of God move in your life. You know the ones that are on milk because every little thing come, they fall in apart. Every little situation come, they can't hold it together. But the ones who are on milk know how to say, listen, if he does it, he does it. If he doesn't do it, he's still, he's still God. And so what does this mean to us? What this means is according to your faith, be it unto you. According to your maturity level in the spirit, be it unto you according to your revelation of God be it unto you according to your perception of God be it unto you according to your desperation for God be it unto you according to your appetite of God be it unto you. What am I saying? Whoever you understand God to be in this season will be the God that shows up for you. Whoever you recognize God to be in this season is the God that will show up to you. Paul says to us in Romans 12 and 2, do not conform to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, then you will be able to test and prove. Some of us can't test and prove in no area of our life because nothing in our mind is being transformed. You are still thinking the way you were thinking 15 years ago and then wondering why you don't see God move in your affairs. Can I tell you, he ain't even there no more. By the renewing of our minds, and this is how we are able to test and prove what the will of God is. It says, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Can I tell you that where there is no mind transformation, there will always be a limited view of God. And where there is a limited view of God, you will always have a limited life. You will always have a limited ministry. You will always have limitations in your health. And you will always have limitations in your money. Everything you believe about God or the lack of your belief is showing up in your life. Oh, I know y'all say, well, we was here for revival for the last. <laughs> we wanted to run around and jump. I ain't got no song like Pastor. I know he came a couple of weeks ago. He had y'all in his singing. I ain't got none of that. I just got this word right here. Listen, that's all I got. Listen, everything you believe about God or what you don't believe is not based upon a hater. It's not based upon a witch, can I tell you? It's not even based upon a principality because there is not a witch or a principality on this planet that can stop what the living God says would be mine. There's not even a generational curse can stop what the living God says would be mine 
And we see this more, more often than not, even in our money, even in our bank account, right at this moment. What you have in your account right now is not based upon what God said you could have. It's not even based upon what God promised you, but it is a reflection of what you believe you can have. This, this grown folk, this, this grown up, this grown up messages today. What you are in your life is not a reflection most times in what God said you can have. It is what you believe you were worthy of. It is what you believe you can have. And this reflection is oftentimes based upon our revelation of God that we choose to come into agreement with. What does that mean? Your life and everything around you is based upon what you came into agreement with. What is agreement? Agreement is you coming into harmony with the thing. It's you coming into action or character. It's you making an arrangement about a specific specific thing. What does that mean? Oftentimes we have come into agreement with a life that God never even sanctioned for us. But because there's no relationship, we are not clear on the life that he gave or the life that we decided to choose. If you looked at your life right now, are you living the life that God spoke to you or did you just take it just because that's what you got? Did you just accept it because you don't believe there is anything else for you? And for many of us, we are living a life that we settled for and not the life that God ordained for us because our spiritual acumen isn't high enough to say just because there are obstacles doesn't mean that God doesn't have another life for me. Just because there has been hell and high water doesn't mean that God doesn't have a life for me. So the enemy presents a life to us that seems easier for us to navigate because it didn't really challenge our faith or our expectation in God. So we accept whatever it is that we are given. This is why I have a problem with this whole soft life movement. What that mean? What? What that mean, really? What, it, what is a soft life? We as believers have to be very careful in what we come into agreement with. Because you will start believing that a soft life is a life of God. And if you know anything about the character of God, whenever he is getting ready to open a door or elevate you, softness is not what you receive. Hell comes before the softness ever comes. And so we have a generation of people that think that success is sitting back and not working. Think that leading is having a title but never having to do the work. We think that you just arrive at wealth without having to make sacrifices. If God himself sacrificed his son for us to even be here, what more will we have to do? Yes, we might be tired. Yes, we might need a break. But can I say to you, we've got to be careful because that's not how God moves. When he wants to do something for you, he doesn't send you a soft situation. This is why so many people are confused about their next step. You have no discernment, no prayer life, no relationship. And so when something walks into your life that seems like it's easy because you are so exhausted in the spirit, somebody said when you are hungry, you will eat anything. When you are thirsty, you will eat anything because there is nothing in you that is willing to challenge where you are. And asking the question, did God do this? Is this the life that God has for me? In our text this morning, we have a woman who is really asking herself the same question. Is this the life God has for me? Because the truth is, I didn't sign up for this. This is, not what, this is not what I signed up for. And in the first part of the text, she goes, the Bible tells us in verse 1 that she goes to Elijah and she begins to talk to him because her husband has died. 
And the truth is her husband was a man of God. Her husband was a part of the school of the prophets. But she finds herself having been committed to a man of God who died and she is now left with the debt that he has. And so she's asking herself, asking at this time, I can imagine, what do I do with this space that I'm in? I don't even have the opportunity to mourn the death of my husband because I'm now trying to figure out how to manage the debt that he left behind. I love the fact that she went to Elijah because it says something to me, and I want you to write this down as a point. Do not come into agreement with a life that God didn't ordain. Do not come into agreement with a life that God didn't ordain. What am I saying? Life be life and for all of us. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care your title. I don't care your stock portfolio. I don't care your age. I don't care how fine you are. I don't care how clear your skin is. Can I tell you, if you live long enough, life will challenge everything about who you are and what you believe. The truth is you can be living your best life today. And tomorrow, everything you thought, everything you thought you have can be pulled right up underneath you. Listen, I don't know about nobody else, but if you have ever lost everything in a matter of a snap of a finger, one day you were doing well, the next day that bank account empty. One day you were healthy, the next day you don't know where this illness came from. One day the children were doing well and now they acting a fool. Life can change quickly for you. And it does not matter who you are. And we see this in the text because she was the wife of a prophet. What that mean? <laughs> she should have been taken care of. She should have had something set up for her. She should have been in a place where she didn't even have to worry about the debt of her husband. But get this, she does. Because you can be a pastor. You can be an intercessor. You can be a leader. You can be here at the top of the hour, be the first one to leave. Listen, the first one to come, the last one to leave. You can give your last to others. You can serve relentlessly. You can be here and they never say thank you. You can invest your own money. You can do everything that is right and still find yourself at a loss even with your title and for those of you who love to want to call yourself pastor you love to want to call yourself prophet you love to want to call yourself evangelist let me move out of ministry you love to want to call yourself a boss you love to want to call yourself a ceo you love to want to say you got the most this and got the most that you are the first target of the enemy be careful the title that you put on your back because that title might be the target that the enemy uses to take from you. And so we have a woman who is here who should be okay because the Bible says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children. I won't go that part today. We'll, we'll, lead, that, we'll lead that for part two. But she's left with nothing. Sometimes, can I tell you, even our financial messes that we find ourselves in is not even ours. It is a result of somebody we were connected to. That debt not even mine. That loss not even mine. That bill is not even mine. But because we were connected to them, we are also paying the penalty for what they left behind. And we don't know the circumstances. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about his life outside of the fact that he was a prophet. So we don't know what he served, what he gave, and then ended up with nothing. We don't know what that looks like. But what we do know is that the wife, his rib, was left in debt. 
with two sons. There are many of us that are here as a result of somebody who died, maybe not physically, but you might have been in a relationship that died emotionally and you are left holding the bag of what that did to you. You are left with the residual damage, with the collateral damage of what that left with you. And now you are trying to figure out, what can I do? How am I going to be able to fix this mess that I find myself in? Listen, pride and ego would have caused her to shut her mouth. How many times I just told you that I go through and nobody may even know what I'm dealing with. That's a spirit of pride and ego. And where there is pride and ego, you will never be able to access the life that God really promised you. Listen, she could have never gone to Elijah and she could have just accepted her life as it was given to her. Her initial life was to be married to a man who was a prophet and they live happily ever after. Do you think she anticipated that her husband, who was a man of God, would die and she would be left with death? How many of us have had calamity and said, it just is what it is? I'm just going to accept whatever comes to me. But I'm grateful that in this text, she refused to come into agreement with a life that God did not ordain for her. She refused to come into a life of debt that was beneath her. She refused to come into a life of poverty that was beneath her. And she refused to submit her sons into a legal system of slavery and forever debt. The problem is what you choose not to come into agreement with will impact not just you, but your children and your children's children. Some of us are living today as a result of what our parents came into agreement with, and now we are left picking up the pieces. What you refuse to accept does not just bless you, but it blesses those who are connected to you. When she went to Elijah to tell him what the problem was, laid down her pride and her ego, she was able to get an answer, which meant that she also provided a solution to shut the door for generational curses. For some of us, your inability to open your mouth, your, in, your ability to move in pride and ego has shut the door on a solution that God has to, for you that will not just impact you, but will impact your family. One thing I want you to know that as she began to talk to Elijah, he said to her, I wonder how I can help you. Tell me, what do you have in your house? Her initial reaction was nothing because th she felt like in face of what she was facing, she didn't have anything that could answer the need of her debt. Are y'all following me this morning? And so her initial answer was nothing. Can I tell you, God will never leave you completely empty. You always... You will always have something in your hands. Right now, many of you think that you don't have, that you are broke, that you don't have this. But can I tell you, if I walked through here and had a conversation with you for just 60 seconds, each of you, I can tell you five streams you have in your hand right now that you don't even work. God will never leave you completely empty. This is why she then says, well, I have a little bit of oil. Listen, the little bit that you think don't mean nothing is the thing that is about to set you up for the next level in which God is about to take you to. The problem is we discard the little because we are comparing our little to somebody else that seems like they got a whole lot. Not knowing who they slept with to get it, not knowing what they sold to have to get it, not knowing what integrity it cost them. Your little is valuable. And that means something in this text because Elijah could have magically done something for her. He knows God. He was a man of God. He could have went and filled up the, the oil, filled up the pots and been done with it. But he didn't do that, and he asked her what she had in her hand. Because in this season of your life, you have got to invest in your own miracle. 
Y'all don't hear me? I know that we are the culture of I want to be put on. I know that we want to network ourselves into stuff. I know we want to connect with this person and connect with that person. Can I tell you that God is the plug? He is the one who has given you whatever you have in your hands that you might be able to work your little and turn it into something else. You've got to know even your little works, even the smallest thing that you don't matter. Can I tell you, the world has a need even for the smallest thing, the little thing that you have. And God will not multiply, hear this, what you are not willing to invest. What are you willing to invest in your own business? So you want me to invest 500000 but you only want to invest $5? You, you want me to give you 10000 to launch a company, but you won't even put in $100? We think that God is a genie. And whatever we, whatever we start declaring, and I believe in declarations, but let me tell you this. This is a season of you investing in the miracle of your own life. If you cannot invest in it, you will not receive a return on it. Why? Because God is the greatest investor that you will ever encounter. His expectation is what he has put in you. You will have the ability to give it back to him, and he will multiply that in what you have. The problem is we don't want to invest. We want miracles to fall out of the sky. We want to walk down the street and it's a million dollars. And it might be so, but can I tell you, there is something to be said about those who will say, Father, this is the little bit that I have. If you breathe on this little bit, if you multiply this little bit, if you give me strategy around this little bit, I know that my life will change. The Bible says that he always gives seed to the sower. If you don't have nothing in your hand, you got to check whether or not you've ever sown. Because if you are a sower, (laughs) this is how things begin to come to you from unexpected people, from unexpected places, because you've all invested as a result of your seed and God is then obligated by his word to return that which you have put in and not to give you the same thing you put in but to multiply that in which you put in this is how you have streams and here in the text we see that initially she held back by saying she had nothing When you hold back from God, you disqualify yourself from the miraculous. I'm not talking about just money. Hear me in the spirit. It's tight. I'm talking about your gifts and your talents. I'm talking about your destiny and your purpose. I'm talking about you moving and operating in the will of God for your life. What have you fully given to God? Because the truth is, you can have some hailers that give him money, but their heart is far away from him. Then you can have others that say, God, take my life and do what you please with it. And he will multiply everything in their life. What have we given to God for him to work with? In this part of your life, in this season of your life, your next supply is going to come based off of what you are able to offer him. What we further see in the text, I want you to write this down. Number three, obedience unlocks the supernatural. Elijah then tells her what to do. He tells her to go go up and down the street borrowing jugs and bowls. Then he gives her specific instructions on what she needs to do after she has them. Can I tell you, obedience in this season will require humility to do what is crazy and uncommon. For some of you, God has given you vision that seems crazy. In the midst of a full debt that you have sitting in front of your face that you don't even know how you're going to pay it off. 
in front of a full sickness, sickness or doctor's report that they have given to you and you don't even know how you're going to work it out. Can I tell you when you begin to open your mouth to petition the help of God, God will then send an answer that is probably going to be uncomfortable for you. He tells her to go up and down the street getting jars. Now y'all know good and well. We wouldn't be able to just go up and down the street asking for jars without somebody saying, well, what you need this for? <laughs> you mean you need all my jars? Well, when you gonna bring them back? Why your sons gotta help you? They, they in trouble too? Y'all know what we do? We talk. And because we know that people talk, so many of us are too prideful to obey. And so that means that you ignore the instructions of God because you don't want to humble yourself to do something that is crazy and uncommon. Can I tell you, your obedience has to be anchored in faith to know that regardless of what they say, regardless of whatever comments they have, do you have a jar that I can borrow? I know you're going to talk about me as soon as I leave, but God said to ask you for this jar, and I'm humbling myself to do what I would not ordinarily do. Because the truth is, if you're not willing to do what is uncommon, stay in the life that you have. Stay in the situation that you are in. Because in order for you to have the key to change it, God is saying, I want you to do what is uncommon. I want you to be anchored in humility. Then I want you to be anchored in faith. And then I want you to shut up, lock yourself in, and do what I told you to do. The problem, too, is we want to make too much announcements. She didn't tell them what she needed to do. She asked them for what she needed to ask for. She went in her house with her children, and she began to do the work that God called her to do. Stop making announcements about what God has told you to do. Shut your mouth, lock yourself up in your home, and begin to do the work. Truth is, we talk too much. You can't succeed because you run in your mouth. You can't get a breakthrough because you talking too much. When God gives you the blueprint for your deliverance, when God gives you the blueprint for you to get to your next level, you don't go post it on Facebook. Well, the Lord told me he doing this. We don't care. What is the outcome? Well, I've been, I've been in sackcloth and ashes for 40 days, but your heart is still the same. He said to go in with your children and lock the door and begin to pour. Go in and begin to obey the instructions of God. Can I tell you, there will be no confirmation in this season. The only confirmation you will have is that that comes directly from the Father. So don't, no need to call sister so-and-so and ask her what God showed her because she ain't going to be able to see nothing. No need to go call brother X, Y, and Z and ask him if he's in agreement because he won't be able to see nothing. You got the instructions. Now go inside, lock yourself and your family up, be quiet, and begin to operate in the obedience of God. The Bible says, listen, the Bible says in Isaiah 1 and 19, if you are willing and obedient, hey, you will eat, you shall eat of the good of the land. Those who are willing and obedient, those who know how to be quiet, lock themselves in with the blueprint of God and begin to work will be the people that will eat of the good of the land. This is why you can't be mad because some folk have done exactly what God said and they are eating from the good of the land. Listen, come the, the stock market crash, I'm still eating. Come the recession, I'm still eating. Come the foreclosures, I'm still eating. Why? Because I got a blueprint print from the father and that is what I am moving in listen look at somebody and say I'm getting ready to eat 
Oh, y'all quiet. Look at somebody else and say, I'm getting ready to eat. I'm getting ready to eat. The last point that I have and we'll get ready to go is, listen, the text says that she goes back to Elijah, the man of God. And he says to her, go sell the oil and make good on your debts. Then he says to her, live both you and your sons on what's left. Can you write this down? You're about to live on what is left. Y'all so quiet. You are about to live on what is left. Can I declare to you that what should have destroyed you is about to be the very thing that launches you into both ministry and marketplace? Can I declare to you the financial issue that you were facing was really just for God to set you up so that he is able to do the supernatural for you? Can I declare to you, you thought that they died and left you when really God was moving them out of the way because he knew that you were an entrepreneur and if you stayed in the same relationship if you stayed in the same situation you would never come into the fullness of who you are you didn't even know that the debt you found yourself in was doing nothing but giving credence to your testimony You were worried about what they would say about you with the jars. Didn't even know that God was setting you up to continuously be blessed. You didn't know that what felt like a calamity for you was setting you up to curse generational curses. You didn't know that this debt would be the thing that would bless your sons and your sons' sons and your sons' sons and not just that but a whole community. Sometimes life happens to us not because God is punishing us but because God is setting us up to be blessed in a way that we never expected. But what we have to remember is that God is calling us to invest in our own miracle. If you can invest in your own miracle, you are about to see the supernatural hand of God move. Listen, the spirit of the Lord says, fret not because I am releasing a word to you in this season that is from a credible vessel that will provide credible instructions to you so that when you get ready to move, you will see what is left in your hands and do so out of obedience so that I can set you up for a continuous pour. Somebody say continuous pour. Somebody say that God is about to do something for me that will go on and on and on and on. I decree and declare that your children will not be enslaved to debt, but they will have entrepreneurship and jobs based off of the work that you do. That your obedience will open the door for you to continue to have something to even serve to the community. But when you can't recognize how God moves, you will think you are just a husband. You are think you are just a wife that you are or just a mother and not even realize you are a full CEO. And that God is shifting the tables, even in things that feel uncomfortable, even in the things that you did not anticipate, even in the stuff that you did not sign up for. God is looking to see how you will steward what is uncomfortable for you. God is looking to see how you will steward loss. I tell people that God does not elevate you based upon your ability to speak in tongues. God does not elevate you based upon your ability to preach, speak well, or lay hands on people well. Can I tell you that God elevates you by watching how you respond to hardship. God elevates you every time you are looking at a debt that you know is beyond you. He's looking to see what you will respond to. And he's asking the question, what do you have in your hands? Do you have anything in your hands that I can use and when you show up and say God I got a little bit of this I got a little bit of faith I got a little bit of going forth I got a little bit of a gift I got a little bit of a mind left I got a little bit of health left I got a little bit of a marriage left I got a little bit of a skill left God will then come in and multiply the little bit of what you have 
Can you stand to your feet this morning? Hallelujah. Listen, I don't know about you, but the last three years have been hell for me. I mean hell. You know how you can have some good moments, but it seems like the good moments don't outweigh all of the hell? You, you, you catch your breath with one thing, and then something else happens to you. You get over that, you catch your breath again, and something else happens to you, and it can start to make you feel like, God, where are you? Do you even see me? Do you know my name? Father, I'm a full pastor. Why am I going through this? No, I'm a full pastor. I serve people that I may not even like all the time. That may not like me all the time. I serve people, give to people, knowing that after I give it to them, they're going to talk about me behind my back. You show up to a job and treat people well when you know they gathering in the break room about how to get rid of you. Oh, y'all quiet in here. You show up in places and you give God your best, sometimes feeling like you don't receive an immediate return on what God is doing. And you feel like, Father, what is happening? But when you begin to understand how God moves, every time a debt that comes that seems impossible, you'll begin to look at it and say, Father, what are you trying to do here? Every time something comes in your life that seems like it's taking something away, your response will begin to be different about it. God, you must be wanting to open a door here. God, you must be wanting to open a window here because where hell is breaking loose, there is always an opportunity for God. And for some of you, you've gone the difficult way. Hear this. Because God wants to ensure that what he does in you, that he is able to sustain it long term. There will be fruit that remains over your life. Can I decree that your hardship was for no reason? It was not for naught, but God added weight to your life. He added weight to your testimony. He added weight to your deliverance. And he's getting ready to bless you in ways that you could have never imagined. Can I tell you, your serving is not in vain. Your showing up is not in vain. Your attending to your marriage is not in vain. Because God is getting ready to do the supernatural. Grab that hand next to you and I just want you to squeeze it tight. Squeeze that hand tight. The Bible says that we don't have a high priest who is not in tune or uh, acquainted with our infirmities. Can I tell you by virtue of the fact that you are a part of this ministry, that you showed up here today, speaks to the fact that God is mindful of you. That he is concerned about every single thing that plagues you. And in the face of difficulty, I want you to do what is uncommon and unseen. Go look for the house. Go look for the car. Go back to get a second medical report. I want you to go be begin to write out the business plan. You don't have to have a PhD to write a business plan out. You have to have faith the size of a mustard seed. And place a demand on the Spirit of God to do that in which he promised. God, once I've given it to you, it's out of my hands. Hey, we're trying to hold on to things when God is now responsible to return that in which we have given to him. Father, we thank you today. God, we are grateful that revival is not just in a church building, but that revival is in our hearts, that we will begin to look at our life differently, that we will begin to look at hardship and challenges differently, knowing that it is your will and your good pleasure to bless us, knowing that it is your pleasure not to withhold anything from us, but to open doors for us, to give us what eyes have never seen, to give us 
us what ears have never heard, Father, to do for us what is unseemly, because we are your children, and you are the God of the universe. It is your will that we not be sick. It is not your will that we be broke, but that we would be blessed and we would do so abundantly. It is not your will that we be homeless, but God, that we have houses that we did not buy, that we occupy land that we did not buy because you are our father and we serve you. If you believe that this morning, just give your father a shout.